Hi everyone, welcome to SOCAP Australia's webinar with SOCAP President Jane Perez from Suncorp Group. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. My name is Charlie Truculia. I'll be the moderator for this webinar. Uh, these days I'm the founder and principal consultant of TRK Coaches and Consultants. We specialise in making our clients more customer centric through better management of complaints. My previous roles have included customer advocates for the National Australia Bank, Head of Customer Relations for the Colonial Group, as well as Assistant Director, Consumer Protection for the Trade Practices Commission. In most of my previous roles, among other things, I was responsible for making sure my organisation met the obligations of the prevailing Australian Complaint Handling Standard. Kathleen Allen from the SOCAP office will be working in the background to make sure we can all connect smoothly and easily. Thank you, Kathleen. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome Fiona Brown to her first SOCAP webinar. Fiona joined SOCAP about two weeks ago as our new Chief Executive Officer. Welcome to SOCAP, Fiona. Now, before we get started, let me go through some housekeeping tips. Uh, the good news is that you as partic participants will be muted, so we won't be able to hear anything happening at your computer. Jane, uh, you're an exception. Please make sure your mobile is off or on silent. Um, if you have trouble hearing the audio via your computer, pl please use your phone. Dial your state's appropriate numbers as listed in the confirmation email sent to you. This webinar is being recorded. This means that we'll be, uh, we will send you an email with a link after the event, all going well in a day or two. Uh, when it comes to your questions, Jane has advised that she will be addressing your questions in the last 15 minutes of today's webinar. In order to ask questions, please have a look at your computer screen. On the bottom left-hand side, there's a message box. Above that, you can also see who's participating in the meeting. Now, you can type your question at the very bottom, and everyone will see it. Um, yeah, right down the bottom, there's a flashing little cursor, bottom left-hand screen. Uh, alternatively, you can select my name and send me a question privately. Um, we will also send you an evaluation email after the event, and we would appreciate your feedback, please. Uh, to become familiar with the technology we're using, we will now see a poll question on the screen. There you go. Can you please do me a favour and tick one of the appropriate boxes or one of the... Oh, here we go. It's all happening. Well, the good news is I can see we've got 36 people uh, that have dialed into the conference, um, and uh, this technology seems to be working really well. Um, we had about 35% uh, that have used the technology before. All right, um, now, it is my pleasure to introduce Jane Perez, our speaker. Most recently, Jane has headed up the ISO uh, 10002 Standard for Complaint Handling Review on behalf of SOCAP Australia, and Standards Australia. She's really looking forward to finally being able to share about the finished product, which was released late last month, the 29th of October to be precise. Jane has had 15 years experience in mediation, conciliation and dispute resolution with the Suncorp Group, a large financial services company. She is an accredited mediator. She holds an MBA with a dispute and resolution major. Jane is a member of the SOCAB board and is the current SOCAB president. Um, the webinar participants have already provided some feedback to SOCAB and we will cover lots of issues today, including the ones we will soon have listed on the screen. Now, I haven't actually got the, uh, the presentation happening on my screen at the moment, so if Kath or Jane could assist with that, that would be fantastic. But in the meantime, Jane, can you hear me? Uh, yes, good. Uh, good morning, Charlie, and everyone else online with us today. Um, I have access to the presentation and I'm trying to click, but I'm not getting anywhere. So maybe Kath can... Um, you, you can control that through the black arrows, Jane, through the yes. black arrows on the top of the screen. I'm clicking on the arrows and nothing's happening. I've now got an hourglass, so maybe it will happen in a moment. Okay, let's see what happens. Um, technology is wonderful and it's even better. Ah, here we go, it's all happening. Yep. All right, 
So maybe if we go to the next screen, Jane, that would be... Oh, here we go. So we've got a bit of an overview of the things that we'll be covering uh, during this presentation. Um, but uh, Jane, let's kick off the formal part of this uh, webinar. So uh, Jane, let's begin with an easy question to start the formal part of the webinar. Uh, what was your role in the development of the new standard? Thanks, Charlie. My role in the, the standard in, has been ongoing now for a, a quite a few years, to be very precise with everyone. Um, we were in discussions with Standards Australia for approximately two years before we actually started the committee process um, about the, what the process entailed to actually look at the revision of the standard um, and the fact that at this time the standard was a number of years old um, and that the complaints world had changed so much in that time and we had to start through the whole process. So establish our business case of why we felt it needed to be updated and put and get support by a number of industries to actually say yes we would be willing to participate in, in that type of a review. Then we had to put the application to Standards Australia for them to consider it. Um, which in the end they did, which was great news, and that was for us la the beginning of 2013. That process started, even though we had approval at the end of 2012 by Standards Australia. So um, it's been a bit of a journey to get us even started looking at the, the standard. Um, and then when the committee was formed, there was quite a number of people involved and Considering SOCAP's involvement in actual getting getting it up and established and whatever, they asked if I would be the representative for SOCAP and be the chair of the committee. Um, and I was very honoured and pleased to be able to, to take that role within the committee um, to ensure that there was representation from the broad membership within SOCAP to ensure that we got all the views and, and all the issues we could possibly consider and on the table for discussion through with the committee. Thanks, Jane. I'm, I'm sure that was a, a big task and took a lot of your time outside your busy schedule um, um, that, that we all have. Hey, who, who else was involved in the development of the standard? Right. Well, I've got a. I've done a bit of a slide up here for you, so I'll just move on to that next one. Um, and I'll see how smart everyone may be if they can work out the colouring that I've used in this this slide. And the um, acronyms. Yes, many acronyms, but um, I, I'm sure most of them are well known to the majority of us. Um, so the committee had a broad representation of people who were actually involved and came to the meeting um, and did the actual work. And then there was others who did the reviews of the work that was completed and if they had any concerns or feedback would then sort of participate at that review level rather at the actual doing level at the same time. So. Um, as you can see there, the black and white were the New Zealand contingent that, that actually came and did the work with us. Um, and then of course the green and gold were the Australian representatives. So um, we got a broad, broad range of membership from ombudsman's offices to government departments at a both federal and state level. Um, SOCAP, we had CHOICE, the Consumer Federation, um, the, some university involvement as well via Dr. Sorden. Um, so yeah, we had a really good represented, representation within the committee. Um, and just being involved in the committee and actually sitting in the room and hearing the different views from everyone around the table and for their consumer group that would be using this standard when working with them, it was really an excellent experience to really understand how broadly these standards are used. and the significance that's placed on these standards in everyone's working environment. And good to see that by my count we had about three SOCAP board members uh, on the committee. So Trevor Slater uh, with the New Zealand Ombudsman and uh, Tanya Souden from Monash University as well as you. So uh, great representation from, from SOCAP. Hey, yeah. tell me, you know, it used to be the Australian standard and we had the international standard, we had the Australian standard and now it's the Australian slash New Zealand standard. How did it come about that New Zealand was involved? Right, when, when the committee first was formed, uh, that's one of the standard pieces 
of the process that Standards Australia follow is looking at how wide ranging is this standard and is it something that New Zealand should be involved in. And they do that across all of the standard committees that they work on because a lot of what we do is done in New Zealand as well. Um, and we felt that as this standard at that time was an international standard, it would be a good opportunity to bring New Zealand on board, particularly those for those organisations who actually may have, such as my own organisation, that has companies um, yes. in New Zealand. Um, and there was a few others like that that it was really relevant to um, ensure that New Zealand was brought in on the journey with us as well. No, that makes perfect sense. Um, okay, let's get to some of the tougher questions. What was the most difficult component of the new standard to get over the line? Um, <laughs> well, I think it would depend who you asked. Um, <laughs> but um, look, there was there was a lot of talk amongst us about the the change of being a complaint handling standard to a complaint management standard, mm. and the difference of those two points from, you know, the, the committee members but also to the people who are going to use this standard in their, their business to the consumer at the end and what that would look like. Um, the change of focus and the, the written style of the standard was probably the most difficult component to, and it wasn't so much to get it over the line but to actually really get the focus and the continual focus throughout the standard because prior to the, the standard prior was a quality it had a quality focus so it was a, it was really about the process and the definitions and they all needed to be done to this standard um, whereas we wanted to make sure that this time that the standard actually had a customer focus or the end user focus so what you're doing what's what are you going to learn or what are you going to get out of this process is going to help improve um, and improve your feedback and improve the experience and really make sure that it was a customer-centric approach rather than a quality approach. Um, so that was probably difficult for Standards Australia to do as well because it's a real change for them in this type of a quality. What had been a quality standard for so many years, we were now looking at keeping the quality component there but putting a customer focus on it as well. Um, so that was probably the most difficult part of the process for everyone involved and for all different reasons. So it was good to have that and to have those discussions but also then as we went through the work that we did was to ensure that that theming and that focus remained in how we wrote things and what we felt was relevant to add into the standard. Yeah, it seems to be a really practical sort of a standard, so not so much theory but there's lots of practical stuff and lots of practical um, um, suggestions and extras to the standard. Yeah, and that was one of the big things that we really wanted the standard to be a document that that's, that gave guidance to. It's great to have this is it, and you, you know this is how you should work, and this is what it should be. But how do you do that, and what are some tips for people to do that? And when we're looking at this standard, it's used across so many different industries by so many different businesses from really you know, large organisations with lots of staff to a, a, a small business that may have you know, a staff of two or three people. So how do you make it relevant for that whole big broad user group? Mm. And that, that's, that's what we wanted to make sure that, the, that what we delivered could, could achieve that. Okay. Hey, I, I think you've you know, uh, taken... You know, the, the next question I was going to ask you was all about, hang on a tick, we've, um, you know, and now we've got a standard as a guideline on complaint management and why have we moved away from complaint handling to complaint management. I think you've probably answered most of that. Is there anything else you want to add to that particular question? Uh, I suppose probably. There's just a few more things that I could just wanted to touch base there on Charlie. Great. And that's probably about, we've talked a lot more about the, the team of people um, the practices so it's not just about here's this here's a process and you should do this within this time frame and it should look like this and um, and touching on some of those points but it didn't go into detail whereas this one we wanted to talk about complaint management so it's not just about handling that complaint on that one particular contact whether it be a call or you know that ongoing engagement but out of that one thing it was about how do you set it up 
what points do you need to look at, how do you get the data, how do you do root cause analysis with the data, some points on how to manage um, difficult behaviours by people that you may experience in the process. So we want to talk about complaint management in a whole, as a whole, not just complaint handling being what was seen by a lot of people as that one point in isolation of a whole big process. Mm. So that's why we changed it over to the complaint management. That makes perfect, perfect sense and, uh, as I said earlier, you know, it makes it a, a lot more practical and you know, user-friendly um, in terms of implementing the changes that are required that are really going to make a difference in terms of uh, complaint management and making your organisation more customer-centric. Um, okay, we've talked about some of the changes, but what, what are the major changes that the new standard that SOCAP members need to be aware of? Look, as I said, there's probably... When you, when you get it and read it again now for the first time after what you've seen in the standard in the previous editions, you're going to notice, as I said, that the, the themes and the focus has changed somewhat. But the, probably the big thing is that we've, we've added a social media aspect to this standard now and it's about any organisation, no matter how big or small you are, there is majority of them have some sort of focus or customer contact point in the social media and it will be across various channels. So more and more people and the younger generation are actually using those channels to complain. And it's talking about how do you, do, how do you address that and how do you bring that into the standard complaints process that you're going to operate within your organisation. And it's things like understanding if you're going to offer that channel like for 24-7, then you need to have a complaints process that's going to be able to be used 24-7 by whoever is monitoring your social media channel. Um, and it, we don't have all the answers because there's actually no one in the world. We did a lot of research and a lot of um, exploration internationally as well as within Australia about who's, you know, everyone's doing things well in social media, but we all operate in such strict legislative requirements in some of our industries of what you can and can't say when we talk about privacy and duties of confidentiality and whatever. There's not a lot of information you can do back in a social media aspect but try and work to get them within your complaints process. So we've done a big focus on, on that um, and talking about making that, making that just a standard part of your complaints process. It's just another medium for them to come in and complain to your organisation and that's how you need to ensure that you build a process to meet that. So that's probably one of the main biggest um, biggest changes. There's also a lot of appendices in the document and as you mentioned before, Charlie, about really practical um, aspects of it. But there's things here that give you the basic information about you know, some methodology on root cause analysis and how that works um, at a very basic level um, because I know there's a lot of organisations that struggle with that concept somehow to how to make it work but how to make it easy particularly when they've got a lot of large amounts of data. Um, so there's a lot of new, new information there. Um, there's also information there about ways to handle some situations and, and different options that you might for have for redress or response to a customer. That information is new in the standard and has not been available before. Okay. Um, for some organisations, they would know this and it would be a part of their you know, okay. everyday work and what they do. But for others, there may be information there and options that they've never considered that were available to them before. So I think those type of things are, are very good. Um, okay. I'm just thinking, Jane, maybe it's time to go to the next slide. Uh, if you could just push on the arrow button uh, yeah. because we are starting to talk about some of the things that are on that slide now. Hopefully oh. that'll work. Yep. Sorry, my, it's just a bit slower. Is that up for everyone now? It's called What Has Changed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think. Um, you've talked a little bit about you know root cause analysis and in the, in the uh, various appendixes attached to the, the standard. Um, anything else there that um, stands out for you? Um, no, I think... Um, apologies is one that's sorry. on the screen. No, so apologies, yeah. So there's a, a section in there, um, an appendix, 
called it's Appendix I, um, Effective Apologies. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, and this, this appendix was actually, a, as you could appreciate, caused a lot of debate within the committee about, you know, should you apologise, should you apologise for everything, how should you word your apology, um, and then of course the, the implications of apologising. So um, I think that was good. And in the end, we come up with a... We were very comfortable with the final version and the work that the New South Wales Ombudsman's Office had done in this space. So, but I think that's a really good tool for anyone. And for anyone who's got, um, you know, new people into their complaints process or perhaps a manager who doesn't work in the complaints process but wants assistance with, you know, writing a letter or a business change team who wants to, you know, how can we do this better? This is really good guidance for them as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, look, moving along, uh, what do you think are the most controversial components of the new standard and, and why? Well, there's probably a few of them. Um, and it's probably so time to go to the next slide. I was just going to say, I'm just trying to work the next slide. So my apologies, everyone. This is no, the, it's the, okay. Just see, there's, a, there's, there's a slight delay, and, and it's only about you know five seconds or so. So we're aware of it now. It'll be fine. Very good. Great. Um, so I've talked already a bit about some of the interesting, challenging changes. Mm -hmm. um, there's probably a couple of things I'd like to um, raise out now for everyone. Um, the one of them, as I said, we've, I've talked about. Um, the options for redress previously. Um, again, not necessarily controversial, but um, when you sort of see some of the practices that, that you know we do on a daily basis, but you see it there writing, it can sometimes make people look at what we do a little bit differently and perhaps question what we do, um, such as in comp you know the different types of comp compensation um, and also satisfaction. Um, you know, what's, what's my version of satisfaction in a complaint will be different to the person sitting next to me. So the options for redress, which is Appendix J, that was, that's probably going to be a bit controversial to those who are reading and understanding this standard that are probably outside the complaints process that don't deal with this type of activity on a daily basis. Um, the other one which I think also is probably going to be interesting Again, for those type of people who are who are reading this and who may not do this or experienced an unreasonable complainant's conduct, so Appendix E is an unreasonable conduct by complainants. So it talks about what is unreasonable complaint conduct, what some and there's principles for dealing with those type of people. Um, and I know, for example, in my organisation. You know, people say, well, I don't have to deal with them. They're, they're being unreasonable. They're, they're difficult or they're that. And, you know, it's explaining to them, well, that's their behaviour in this circumstance. It doesn't warrant, you know, a comment. We need to deal with them. And I think all of us are starting to see in the complaints area, we're starting to see people that are, you know, under a lot more stress for various reasons than we've had previously. And I think we need to understand how to better deal with that and also for the new people in our teams. But to actually see it as an outsider who doesn't deal with these type of, who doesn't deal with complainants every day, that can be very confronting what it says and how you should deal with them and how you should handle them. Mm. So I think that's probably going to be a bit controversial perhaps for some of the more senior managers in larger organisations yes. um, on, on doing that. The other thing too that I think may be... Um, a little bit controversial or challenging in some organisations is the responsibilities um, and involvement of senior managers in the process. So I know that previously in the standard it talked about, you know, what should senior managers in the roles and like CEOs do and things like that. Whereas now in the standard it goes into a lot more detail about what should the people in the higher level, the CEO of the organisation. So we've determined it to be CEO, but it means, you know, the most senior manager, the president, the minister, whoever it is, you know, has the ultimate responsibility. Um, 
what their responsibilities are in the process. Yes. Um, and so there's a lot more detail and not more specific in that. Not, not, not only is there you know, a lot more detail, I, I've got a private question from a, one of our listeners that basically says, hey, the, um, the international standard 10002 uh, was you know, published in, in July. But to me, it was a slight amendment. The difference yeah. between um, the 2006 Australian standard and the, you know, the newly published standard is it's a complete rewrite. Um, it's, it's not just a, an addition of a few uh, sentences, an addition of a few in another appendix or, or two. This, this has been a complete rewrite and it's significantly different to um, the international standard. And I think I've mentioned it before in some of my commentary. I think, I think you know, Australia and New Zealand now take the lead in terms yes. of complaint management and complaint handling. And one of the things that really stands out for me is the importance that's placed on the chief executive of the organisation um, in terms of the complaint management policies, procedures, staffing, training and everything else. So, so um, ha how did that come about and you know, who were the main drivers uh, on, on the committee uh, in relation to this? Oh great, well that's a really good observation and it's a good question and I might just take a moment Charlie just to explain how we got into that space if everyone's comfortable with that. Um, so when we, we started this process and, and we got approval to proceed proceed to revise this standard, um, we did, we started, we commenced the work and we were working underway and we also put the proposal to the International Standards Committee mm -hmm. and said this is what we were doing and, and sort of suggested that they may wish to do this as an international standards review. And at the time back from the International Standards they said no, we're comfortable with the version as it is, we believe it's still current. Um, and we don't want to do it as an international standard at this time. So we we then determined, well, we both, we believe we need to do this work. We believe it is actually, we, we're nearly 10 years down the track from the initial yes. release of the ISO standard, and we believe that the world has changed a lot since then, and we, we then agreed to proceed to, to write it, and we were going to do it as um, an Australian and New Zealand standard. And that's what we've proceeded down that path to do. Now, the ISO standard updated their current version of the ISO standard back in July, but it was very minor amendments to some wording in the standard, not the level of work that we're doing now. And since we've finalised this, we've, we've provided the copy of it back, and now they're going to want to look at when they do the next review of actually reviewing that standard and looking at what we've done here. Because they can see the significant differences now in what we've produced now to where this, the, the ISO standard is. So I do expect that sometime in the not too distant future we're going to see this release back out as a, a, an ISO version as well. But, but there is a process involved in that and after my experience in understanding the standards process, it's not going to happen very quickly with the international level, but it will happen. So, I, I, you, I, so the message I've got here is if you're going to spend a bit of money, uh, spend it on the new Australian New Zealand standard. Don't bother with the <laughs> July edition of the international standard. Does that sum it up? <laughs> yes, that's correct. Absolutely. A better way to spend spend everyone's money is to do it with the new Australian New Zealand standard. Okay. Um, anything else you'd like to add uh, to, uh, on that particular issue? Anything about the, you know, the responsibilities of the uh, executive officer and how all that came about? Uh, yes, so what we felt within the committee was we believed that there were, for most industries, regardless of size, you know, as I said, the small business to the large organisations, the, the chief executive, for the majority of them at some level they are interested in what's, what's happening and what's, what's affecting their business and for those organisations, particularly um, in government organisations where ministers and so forth, they're much more interested in what's going on with a big consumer focus now um, and also you know, in organisations, and I can speak about mine by financial services, you know, we're all regulated, we have codes of practice. There's so much going on where complaints are a really important component of that, but they're a big indicator of how your business is travelling. 
And we really felt as the committee level that we needed to make sure that the CEO or, you know, whoever that, you know, the highest person in the organisation really needed to have, for the want of a better word, some skin in the game here and to really commit to actually ensuring that if you you have a complaints process, you set the team up, you make sure that they're educated, that they have the tools that they need to be able to perform this job really well because this is a key component of keeping your business running well and understanding what's happening with your business. So that's why we felt it was really important to actually implement this and put this into the system and put it into the standard as well. And I think that's a fantastic development. You know, with, with my background, I, I remember a few years ago, well, 2006 to be specific, when that standard came out, I think everyone sort of sat back in the organisation I was with at the time and, and waited for someone to do something uh, about it. And um, I can tell you that no one certainly bothered to tell the uh, Chief Executive Officer that uh, they had some responsibilities. Uh, when I finally did tell the executive officer they did have uh, some responsibilities, uh, that's when things really started to happen. So I, I think to go into this much detail is fantastic. And uh, one of the key things for our members going forward is to make sure that they or uh, an appropriate person in their organisation, if they feel it's not them, uh, does advise their executive officer of the changes to you know, the standard and the responsibilities that they now have. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, it always helps. Well, my experience always been, it's not just you standing there saying it, say, here it is, here it is in the sink. This is what, you know, this is what we should be doing. This is... You know, what we're saying is a really good level of involvement and commitment from yourself. Mm. Um, and and it, it, sets the, it sets the level, you know. And if you can get this level and you're getting over and above, well, that's fantastic for organisation. Yes. And I think the, the other thing ends up being, obviously, you know, we'll touch upon this um, in the next couple of questions, but uh, when it comes to complaint management, complaint handling, there are a lot of regulators involved in various industries. There are various codes um, for you know, various industries. It, it, it cuts across all industries, uh, the public sector, the, uh, the, the, the private uh, sector. So uh, it's really important that we collaborate with our uh, colleagues in compliance, in risk, in audit, depending upon the size of the organisation, because not only do we have complaint management skills, there are now going to be uh, compliance skills, uh, sorry, uh, compliance requirements as well. So it's probably a good time to work with our colleagues and um, identify the key issues that need to be implemented and how to go about that. So does, does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, you know, my organisation's a big organisation and they sort of look to us to say, well, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, we're all going to do and here's the work compliance have to do and this is what I think we should be doing there. And we really make it, you know, we're all working on this together. It's not just my responsibility because I manage the complaints department. Mm. It's everyone's responsibility. Yeah, to use the old analogy, the, the, the whole isn't in my side of the ship. <laughs> uh, yeah. We need to work on this together, otherwise the whole ship goes down. So, uh, you know, we, we've got to get it right and we've got to work together. That makes uh, lots of sense. Look, as I was alluding, a lot of our members are from industries where uh, regulations or codes require their organisations to meet all or some section of the standard. Do we know how long um, people will be given to meet the new standard and how that works? Can you answer that question? Well, I, I, I probably can't give you an answer on behalf of those regulators. I do know that a lot of the regulators were involved in the process, more so in the review part of the process. So they're well and truly aware that this um, standard, you know, has been released. Um, but I think it's going to be a little while before they actually, you know, get a get it get it reviewed and reviewed. So, for example, with the regulatory guideline that we all have to follow now in financial services um, regulatory guideline 165. You know, I know that eventually we are going to have to, they will review that and we will need to adhere to it. But my suggestion to anyone right now is if if you review your process and you get it and you work and you get it to be compliant with this, 
new standard, you're well and truly going to be ready for anything in the work that they may do going forward and, and you know, you'll have just done the work and you'll have done it earlier. Plus you're going to have a process quick a process quicker than others have or competitors have that actually meet this new standard. So I think there's a win-win there for you regardless of what happens. But I do believe that the regulators in all sort of aspects for financial service providers, government and whatever, they're going to look at this and bring this on board, um, I would suggest, fairly quickly when they read what's what's contained in it. And the, pre, the pre-warning, for the want of a better word, or their involvement in it already so they know what's contained. And the positive feedback's been great. So I think we'll see a lot more in that space in the not-too-distant future. That, that makes perfect sense. And I, and I, I totally agree with your comment that uh, if, if you make sure that your organisation complies with uh, the Australian standard, uh, there's a very good chance that you'll be meeting any future requirements um, that uh, the regulators or the various you know, codes uh, come up with. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, often those re you know, regulations and, and codes require you to either meet with completely, you know, with, with the full standard or parts of the standard. So, um, yeah, you know, being ahead of the game uh, is good for uh, people in consumer affairs, complaint handling, um, good, good for the uh, customers as well. Um, all right. Um, I, I guess the other you know, uh, mirror image of that is that is do nothing an option for SOCAP members now that the new standard is published? Um, well, yes, you could do nothing. Um, as I said, the, the previous version isn't um, outdated as yet in regards to some regulators and whatever, but I would recommend if you get on the front foot now and get this and do some work, you've got some time to do it and you'll have time to do it properly and to really consider all this. Plus, you'll also have time to work with your business change teams and your compliance team to build it in and to build really robust processes around it. Um, mm. So... That you're not doing it with a very short time frame as well. Yes. Um, I see on your um, slide that uh, obviously, you know, you're saying ensure the standard is included in all planning and future projects in your organisation. Um, any, anything else you'd like to say on, on that point? Um, oh, there's probably a whole lot more, Charlie, that I could say no. in, on that point. Um, but... I think the standard, as we've said, the standard is a working it's a working standard. It's been designed to help you do this do this at a much broader level than it was before. Um, and you know things like we've got sections in there on root cause analysis and data and and things like that. It's actually taking the time to understand this and understand what that means and allowing you to actually really build those processes around that. So I would definitely suggest that you, you get it and you you spend the time and you meet with those other teams before you go and start doing any work so that everyone's on that journey with you and that if someone's building something right now that's going to impact you, that they understand what you're going to be working with. So if they're building a new system or they're designing a new product, um, you know, that you're getting, you're getting to put your position and what you're looking at and you know, what you need to help the complaints process work better or the, the data out of your complaints process to feed back into that system for them. You're getting the time now to do it and do it in a considered environment and then instead of trying to do it in a short time frame and not, not perhaps achieving the best you could out of the standard. Or the okay. use of I've just noticed the time and I'd like to remind all of our participants that in about five minutes' time, we'll start the question-answer session um, I've had a couple of questions come up that we've already uh, addressed, but now might be a good time for those participants to think about things that, uh, uh, that we haven't covered that they might want answered. So please go to uh, the bottom left-hand corner and uh, type any questions that you may have in the next five minutes or so, um, and we'll look to answer those um, in the last 15 minutes of the uh, webinar. Um, Jane, in your role at Suncorp Group, 
what, have, yep. what steps have you taken uh, towards making sure that your organisation meets the standards? So we may as well go to the guru. Uh, you know, you've been involved, you've been the chair, you know, you know how it works. So um, uh, what, what are the first steps? What, what have you been doing at your organisation? Well, I'd love to say to you, Charlie, that you know, while I've been on the committee, I've been doing all this work in the background internally. <laughs> um, and you know, my process is fantastic already. Um, but I haven't been doing that, everyone. So um, I won't come out and pretend to you that I've done all of that work. Uh, a part of the committee, of course, I was required to, you know, sign up to committee charter and how we needed to work. So I've now, since the version's gone live, I've got it off, and we're now internally completing a review of our processes, looking at what I think we can change, looking at our social media strategy um, for the group. So, you know, each I work in a big organisation that has separate business units, but they'll all have their own social media strategy. But how do I ensure that it's going to hit the mark for what we need it and, you know, what I need as well across that? So they're the type of things I'm doing right now. I'm also, um, in, in my case, my organisation, we're building our own in complaints database right. um, and this has worked really well now for us because we're, we're looking at the root cause analysis information and some of the other information in here and determining how we can sort of automate the root cause analysis process in the system as we're building it instead of trying to do it at the end or when it's too late and then you're trying to, you're doing all these workarounds to get the data out. So. Um, I've taken, you know, some action like that. Um, I've also had a chat with um, my CEO. So he was so pleased and I said, I, I want you to do some more in this space. <laughs> so, um, and he's like, really? Do, you, do I have your job as well as have to do my own? I said, yes, that's what I employ you for. But anyway, I'm very lucky I have an excellent C group CEO who is really committed to the complaint handling and making sure we get it right. So, you know, I, I believe I'm probably one of the luckier ones out in our, in, particularly in my industry. Yes. Um, one of the other things I've also done is that I have considered, you know, when we talked to, before about the CEO, but also the skills and attributes of the staff within your complaints handling team. So I've taken what's in the standards and I've also taken the SOCAP competency framework that of the, sorry, I'll call it the correct name, the Australian Competency and Ethical Framework for Complaints Professionals. So I've looked at both of these things and also looked at where are we at, what have I got internally to make sure that I have all our complaint staff, that I'm comfortable, that we meet the standard and that we... Um, you know, we are complaints professionals and looking at what have I got internally that needs to be trained on the job, what SOCAP offerings have I got that can help to train so that I can ensure that all the people in our complaints handling teams are actually up to that, that standard. So I think that's a really imp important thing and we're also looking at those staff skills and attributes and making sure that our position description reflects it and that our interviewing process um, reflects those so that they can show those examples to ensure that we're getting the right people into the role. Right, and at the end of the day, look, that, that, that's what it's all about, you know, right people in the right role with the right skills and the right training. And of course, that's a really good segue into uh, the next question, and that is, what is SOCAP planning to do to help its members in meeting the new standard? Well, there's a few things going, and Charlie, I, I will al allow you to talk a little bit more about, you know, some of the work you're going to be doing with SOCAP going forward. Um, I'm certainly comfortable to put this out there that I'm sure in the com SOCAP community of practice activities over the next few months, we're going to have more and more discussions at a members level about what we've learnt, what we're doing. Um, SOCAP will also, you know, ensure that any updates or any information about who's reviewing the standard from a regulatory perspective and things like that is also out so that all our members can be kept across what's going on in that space. And we'll keep everyone up to the two about what's happening in the, you know, the, the international standard review as well. But Charlie, I'd be really keen to hear a little bit more from you about, you know, some of the workshops that you're looking at starting up over the next couple of, well, the next little while. 
Exactly. Look, we've started off some conversations in terms of uh, what we um, should be doing, and obviously this uh, webinar, and maybe we'll, we'll have another couple of uh, webinars in the next uh, few weeks um, in order to draw out some more of the issues around um, the new standard. Uh, the plan then is to run uh, master classes on the standard and the implementation of the standard. Um, and we're looking to do those sooner rather than later. And in a lot of ways, we're really in the hands of our members. Um, strategically, we're thinking uh, it would be good to get in early, but we realise we're in you know, the middle of November, um, December, Christmas, all that stuff is just around the corner. So one option is to do a couple of uh, master classes in uh, early, mid-December, um, depending upon what our, the feedback we get from our uh, members. Uh, alternatively, what we're looking to do is start the master classes in January, February, run them around all the capital cities. Uh, we're looking to restrict the numbers to groups of about 20, 25 per master class or, or workshop. Uh, we're also looking to go to New Zealand and uh, assist our members, uh, uh, SACAP members that are based in New Zealand as well. So um, uh, that's the plan, but we're really looking for feedback from our members in terms of what they would like to uh, see covered in those workshops and um, the uh, masterclasses. So there will be an evaluation following this particular webinar, and people have already given us some ideas in terms of what they'd like to see covered. So we intend to listen to our members and deliver on what they'd like to see. Um, so um, I think that probably you know, covers that. Um, now, uh, good to see that we're starting to um, get some questions coming through. So uh, by, by all means, please, now is the perfect time. Uh, the, the, the formal part of the um, interview session uh, is now over. So what we're looking to do is address the questions uh, that uh, the participants may have. So um, what I'm, I'm going to be doing is um, um, putting those questions or trying to answer as many of them as possible. Um, so uh, we've got three or four questions, so please keep those questions coming. Um, that would be much appreciated. Um, there'll certainly be an advance notice in relation to the master classes. Um, the question is around you know, uh, the master classes plan uh, for January, um, and um, Fiona and Kath will certainly get uh, material out within the next uh, couple of weeks in terms of what's scheduled and what's planned, and uh, people have the uh, option to register for them as, as quickly as possible. Um, one of the questions is um, for you, Jane, is did the committee discuss how the roles and responsibilities would apply in the public sector where officers and elected politicians both play a leadership role? How do you see the standard as being relevant to elected politicians? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, so, yes, we did have... We had a very robust discussion about this um, and particularly to the, the difference in... Australia and New Zealand on this particular point and, and how that operates. Um, the, the final view of the committee was that both the most senior people, and whether that is, you know, you may have a minister and, and then you will have, or a politician, and then you'll have, you know, the head of the department or wherever that may be. We really felt that the, the responsibility here lied with the person who has the most day-to-day -day control. Um, so that may in some circumstances be the elected politician, but others it may be like a CEO or someone who sits there and manages the staff and manages the processes and takes the accountability and responsibility for that because they're ultimately the ones who are going to be on the line for the performance, whereas the elected politician doesn't necessarily have that role and accountability. But we also believe that these standards could be applicable at, at either at either role that the per person may have in that senior executive level within um, the government. Okay. I hope that, hope that explains that for you, Jason. Okay. 
Um, and uh, people have highlighted the fact that a uh, annual leave is coming up and let's make sure that uh, the work we're doing doesn't necessarily clash. So look, we'll certainly take that on board and uh, schedule the appropriate uh, webinars, masterclasses um, as, as required. And I think um, you know, one option is certainly to wait until late January, uh, February to do that. But uh, we've also got a few people telling us that they'd like to see something before then. So um, we'll, we'll take that on board. Um, now, uh, Lorraine asks a good question. Uh, how do the skills section in the standard relate or complement the new framework SOCAP is working on with Monash? Oh, great. Excellent. Well, we were very lucky, Lorraine, to have um, Tanya Sodom was involved, sorry, Professor Tanya Sodom was involved in both um, the professional standards, but she's also a key committee member. Um, and a lot of, you know, and I worked on both these activities with Tanya. Um, but a lot of the skills that are in the um, framework document are very similar or a, a different word, for example, of what she's in Appendix F in the standard. So we talk about um, the, the framework skills as tone of voice and demeanour, communication, problem solving, and that's what it's called to in the standard. So it's strong oral and written skills, it's questioning skills, it's interpersonal skills. So I believe that they really complement and match each other in a lot of ways. And I haven't found a whole lot of difference um, in my assessment and that the work that I'm completing. I also know within the framework that um, the framework actually goes really well with the standards because it talks about um, a lot of, it's a very shortened version in a way of a lot of the more detailed information that is in the standard, such as an impartial practice and the information provided by the complaints professional, confidentiality, procedural fairness and all of those which are components of what is in the standard. So I think the two documents are really well together and will ensure that we have a really well trained and well set up process but also that our team members working within the process. One of the things that um, I've discussed with Fiona is the possibility of you know, running uh, another couple of webinars um, and I think um, Professor Tanya Sowden would probably be uh, someone that we'd be interested in interviewing uh, to get her perspective on these things because obviously uh, very much in, uh, in, in, in tune with what's going on was involved with um, the development of the new standard. So that's certainly uh, a possibility. Um, I'm just trying to think. We, we are now very close to time. Um, looking forward to maybe one or two more questions, um, if uh, we've got them. Um, Jane, while we're waiting for the last couple of questions, maybe think back and um, summarise, highlight the key issues that you'd like to highlight. Um, yeah, thanks, Charlie. Uh, as I said, the, the the key things I'd like to highlight for you is that, again, this standard gives you much more, it's, it's much more broader and it gives you a lot of practical information in the appendices to actually help you deliver what you need to deliver. And, and some of those ideas that you know you, you sort of had but you, you've got no real information or you need a little bit more guidance or a bit more practical information to implement them, I believe that these are, these are in the standard. And a lot of in the standards too, it helps you sort of go, yeah, okay, what I'm doing is the right way but here's some actual tips that may help me refine some of the practices we've got. So it is a really good tool. Um, when you go on the standards website and you want to obtain copies, there's a lot of different ways that you can, you know, if you can get electronically or hard copy, um, you know, there, you know, just grab it, um, whatever way is going to work for you. Get it off the site, get it in and use it, and you know, and give it to your team members and see what they can do with it and what view they take out of the information, because that was one of my biggest learnings was how similar around the table everyone was about what they were talking about, but just the little differences in what they do or what their legislation enables them to do um, and what particular words meant for us in Australia were different to what they meant in New Zealand and, and just little things like that. So I think it's a really good talking tool. Okay, uh, noticed a couple of questions uh, from uh, Lorraine. 
and uh, they're around what processes are in place to review against the standard, uh, can say CAP recommend consulting services to help. The short answer is, so when it comes to consulting services, no, so CAP doesn't recommend anyone in particular. What I do recall was that with the 2006 standard, uh, SOCAP itself developed a tool to assess against the standard and uh, we had uh, Susan Brooks um, do a number of assessments for our uh, members um, at, at a cost, uh, obviously, uh, to the members. But uh, look, that's something that, uh, as far as I know at this stage, SOCAP hasn't considered um, doing. Um, I'm sure that uh, that is probably going to be a topic of conversation possibly at the next uh, SOCAP board meeting. Um, and uh, lucky last, Margot says, could you say more about the new framework being developed with Monash? Um, she's not familiar with it. So just maybe you know, 30 seconds on that point and uh, it'll be time to uh, finish up. Great. Okay, Margot. So we, so SOCAP has been working with Monash University um, on designing a framework. It's a part of a bigger piece of work, but this was the first part of what we've looked at and um, then what we can develop out of this um, framework as well. And the information is available. Um, I'm sure it's available on the SOCAP website. Um, but the framework itself talks about you know, what we did to develop it and who was involved. And there was a large range of industries and people involved. Um, and it talks about the framework, what it was, and it talks about starting a complaints process and the role of a complaints professional because that's what we as um, an organisation felt that, you know, the level of commitment and people put to this career needed to have some more recognition around it and how could we bring that to the table and an opportunity came up for SOCAP to be able to be involved in this project and to develop this um, framework and we've worked with Monash and we've come up with a real, what I think is a really good framework document but Mago, I will ensure that we get a copy of that framework sent over to you and if there's anyone else that would like a copy please let us know and we'll make sure that the framework's sent to you so you can have a look at it as well. Jane, um, there's only one thing to say to you and I'll do it in my Elvis voice and that's well, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> and thanks everyone else for participating in today's uh, webinar. Please take the time to fill out the evaluation survey for us. We'd really like to see that. Um, and don't forget, stay tuned for notification about our upcoming workshops and standards. We'll get uh, those to you uh, as soon as we can. Uh, thanks again. And uh, Elvis is leaving the webinar. Bye now. Thanks very much, everybody.